A very good evening to all our Pinkish Foundation viewers. Today, before us, we have a topic, a topic of relevance, the Gandhism's relevance in today's world. In a world full of ambiguity, negativity, and violence, I would like to state Gandhi. You must not lose hope in hope and faith in humanity. Humanity is an ocean. If a few drops of ocean are dirty, the ocean does not become dirty. On, a, on that note, I would like to introduce you all to the Pinkish Foundation. So the Pinkish Foundation is a foundation that works on menstrual hygiene. This year, we celebrate our five years of this wonderful foundation. The foundation has worked on menstrual hygiene and about two lakh volunteers are associated with our Pinkish Foundation. And today, we, as we celebrate the 275th edition of the Pink Talks, I would like to state that we have some amazing panelists ranging from universities of technology to sociology, politics, and even law. And that makes this discussion even more intriguing and exciting. And so on that note, I would like to bring on this relevance of Gandhism in today's day and age. I would like to state how Gandhi's key principles on the gospel of love, non-violence, secularism, ethics, morality, justice, a symbolism of Gandhi that stands relevant and maybe will stand relevant for our entire lifetime. Well, we may have some views that are opposing to that, but what is a panel discussion? without the two-sided views and the two-sided intriguing aspects that come into a panel discussion. And on that note, I would like to call upon Ashi Sahuji Bhaiya to give his views on this topic before us. Over to you, Ashi Bhaiya. Thank you, Anita. Uh, good evening to one and all present uh, here today. I am Ashish Sahuji from uh, Aurangabad, Maharashtra, and I have been a student of College of Dairy Technology. Well, before I begin my remarks today on the relevance of uh, Gandhi, uh, let us all join together and pray uh, homage to the divine memory of Mahatma Gandhi on, uh, his, uh, on the evening of uh, his birth anniversary. As uh, his uh, beloved uh, bhajan, in which he stated, Allah tero naam sabko sammati de Bhagwan. These two lines are uh, quite profoundly the main idea that Gandhi taught us as a nation. These were his favorite versions and uh, that gave us the main idea of uh, how we are going to shape in, uh, into a nation as a free India. With a nation with such a pluralistic society, with his, its vibrant colors and advantages, we know that uh, these same pluralistic uh, societies have been a coon or a principal challenge for us to keep them all together. But it was Gandhi's thought of uh, Sadbhav that uh, has bring us all together into one nation and gave us the identity that we all boast around the world today. And in my belief, so as long as this nation stays and our identity is as uh, Indian stays, uh, Gandhian thoughts are never going to be relevant in the country because they are so deep rooted in our nationhood and your hearts as an Indian. Secondly, the principles that Gandhi taught us as a nation were the same principles which were boasted by great philosophers and uh, visionaries like Bhagwan Gautam Buddha and Bhagwan Mahavir. The same principles of Satya and Ahinsa. The principles which are not just about uh, having a society or just about the politics. But these are the principles that have uh, boosted morality and uh, idealism in our society from right from the childhoods, right from the, when we were in schools or uh, when we were uh, upbringing in our upbringings as a person. These are the values of non-violence and such that have shaped us into the people or good people that we have. So in the day and age today, when the relevance of the Gandhian thoughts are being the question of the time have come where we are uh, revisiting the Gandhian ideology and checking its relevance. I think, I think as long as these values are uh, in the societies that uh, were boasted and uh, retort to us as a nation, the values of Satya, Ahinsa and Sadhbhav, I think Gandhi is going to remain in our heart and uh, relevant in our nation as well. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ashish Bhaiya. And the three points that you made, Satya, Ahimsa, and Sat, uh, Satya and Ahimsa are the two key principles that drive us. And having this as the core principle of any lifetime is what is necessary in the day and age that we are in the present times. We may consider his thoughts somewhere in the pre-independence, but what is important and what is relevant in today's time is that these core principles that are stated by Ashish Bhaiya are all that matter in today's day and age, wherein people should imbibe these core values and principles in their day and age and their life as core principles so that they can lead a life like Gandhi, a life filled with faith, hope, ahimsa, and justice and positivity. And now on that note, I would like to call upon Sakshi Di to give her views. A very good evening, everyone. Sakshi this side, and uh, I am pursuing a BTech in Computer Science from WIPS Delhi. And uh, thank you, Pinkish, for having me in today's panel discussion. So, uh, Gandhi, a beacon of hope to millions of Indians who were bored under the weight of years of slavery, a person who was in the vanguard of Indians' freedom struggle. He was the man who could talk with the crowds and still keep his virtue and not lose common touch. And the perfect example of ordinary people coming together to do extraordinary things. His philosophy has always been a uh, topic of discussion, especially in this fast uh, globalizing world. And one would wonder that what may be the relevance of uh, Gandhi in this all-pervading materialistic culture. In the present uh, state of affairs in India, Gandhi's teachings are mostly confined to textbooks. And uh, talking of non-violence, which was a great weapon used by him during the freedom uh, movement of India against British Raj, societal values today have uh, degraded to such an extent that people don't hesitate to kill someone for the gratification of their own needs. And normally, people say that non-violence is a weapon of weak. But in reality, non-violence and tolerance require great level of courage and patience. Statistics show that country is definitely not succeeding in uh, Sarbodhya, meaning uh, universal upliftment or progress of all. On the contrary, India today has a, a unique distinction of being the only country in the world which has the richest man in the world, while at the same time, third of its population lives in dire poverty. His philosophy of uh, Satyagraha, which uh, according to him meant the force which uh, born of truth or violence is required more in the contemporary world scenario where accumulation of nuclear weapons has uh, become the means to attain supremacy. Despite the efforts of various peacekeeping force, the threat of nuclear war persists in the subconsciousness of the world and the only method which has the potential to this ever lingering fear is Satyagraha. Earth has enough human needs, but not for human greeds. These lines of Mahatma Gandhi reflect upon uh, how human behavior destroys nature and how a sustainable way of living is the need of the hour. Uh, in a world that is whirling under the pressure of global warming, uh, change, resource crunch, there is a significant requirement of Gandhian idea of uh, more than today than the past days. His idea of trusteeship holds uh, relevance in the current scenarios as, as people live lavish lifestyles and destroy the resources, recklessly uh, indebting the future generations. And it's true that, you know, there is a vast difference that has come in the approach and mindset of India's, Indians in, this, in these 60 years of independence. Thus, it is imperative that people look askance at uh, individuals who will try to propagate Gandhiism. Gandhian principle, but despite this, it is Im impossible to deny the relevance. The only change is, uh, the only change that can be made is to serve the same cuisine, but on a different platter. And Gandhian, uh, Gandhiji's political contribution 
options offered us independence but his ideologies uh, enlightened india as well as the world even today after so many years and therefore in the turbulent times where the world is grappled with so many problems uh, it is imperative to strive to inculcate inculcate gandhian philosophy in various facets of life and government thank you thank you so much sakshi bhi and the beautiful points that you made on sarvodaya being the key principle for any indian citizen and the development of a nation wherein people should be re- you know should be universally uplifted and there should be a progress for all this is the key principle that we should keep as a as a government or as a country that is aiming towards development because when we look at sarvodaya which means the upliftment of all that is the key and essential area that we are looking at in uplifting any country or any community of people and then the second point on the point that you made on trusteeship well that is something that is also seen that it is being followed in the present time the idea of csr the corporate social responsibility that most of the organizations are following is an evidence that how trusteeship is being followed and is being acquired by the organizations where they're sending x percentage of their profits to the community and the welfare of the society and well that is very important and that is what trusteeship in gandhian idea also stated and we when we look into the non uh, the uh, the ngos that we have and the other governmental schemes that we have they're looking at trusteeship in a manner even the taxation that we look at is a outcome of the trusteeship wherein a person is giving a percentage of their income when they are they have that excess income with them they're putting that um, x amount of percentage into their trusteeship into helping others and well that is the key principle of upliftment and both these point of sarvodaya and trusteeship are going hand in hand in how universal upliftment and upliftment of communities and the underprivileged and well upliftment of all is all that gandhi always believed in and well we must continue that perspective as well now may i invite koshal singh bhaiya to give his point of view and his argument on this discussion uh, a very good evening to one and all present here and first of all a very happy ashtami and a very happy belated uh, gandhi jayanti to one and all present and <clears throat> as we celebrate uh, the azadi ka amrit mahotsav 75 years of india's independence which is again being celebrated under uh, mahatma gandhi's banner as he being the father of the nation uh, it is important to understand and it is also important to confront and to not to conform to a certain set of views which have been i believe very subtly indoctrinated into our thought process and they have been perceived uh, under very romanticized terminologies as uh, quote unquote idea of india quote unquote india's dna etc etc now the problem with any idea or the problem with any individual or the problem with any uh, individual's idea is that you either die young as a hero or you live long enough to become the people's villain and i think that that is what has happened with gandhi's view first of all in modern day 21st century gandhi's thoughts are not gandhi's thoughts they have metamorphosed metamorphosized themselves into what we today know as the neo gandhian thought that's a and now when we look at new gandhian thought new gandhian thought has become very corruptible that's first and b it has become open to interpretation by anyone and everyone who may even not be a stakeholder in the uh, guardian in the original gandhian thought itself now to give two very small examples every civil disobedience movement post independence post 15th august 1947 has been fought under gandhi's name under gandhi's idea under gandhi's banner now the very first example which i would like to take is the Sar- uh, sardar sarovar dam project uh, the uh, tribal movement which is against sardar sarovar sarovar dam project and second we have the narmada bachao andolan the nba which was fought in madhya pradesh rajasthan and gujarat now the leaders of these particular two movements said that we are following gandhi gandhi's idea of giving villagers their equal rights giving tribals their equal rights but 
very selectively they missed out gandhi's quotation on how development has to be brought out to every single household of uh, uh, india's every single village and the sole idea of bringing projects like narmada bachao andolan and sardar sardar sarovar dam project was to increase the arable and the agricultural land uh, schema land bank of india and to provide irrigation facilities to all that's first second gandhi's world view was present in or gandhi's thoughts were present in every single uh, sphere of public life that included international relations that included economics that included political science that included socio cultural uh, uh, schemata of the nation state or the socio cultural slate of the nation state now let me go into every single of these aspects which i mentioned international relations gandhi's ideas if you look at if we compare it to the constitutional law uh, to the constitutional law uh, of india we see that gandhi's entire idea set of ideas has been brought out in uh, part 4 of the indian constitution which is the directive principles of state policy which tells how the indian state has to be governed or what are the model guidelines of governance for the indian state gandhi's ideas on international relations talked about mutual coexistence talked about international agreement it talked about non violence now in modern day uh, 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 world or in the modern day in in the day and time which we are living where do we find mutual coexistence where do we find uh, international cooperation where do we find mutual agreement and if we are to follow gandhi's ideas it is for us to decide because a lot of people when this is said they don't like it it is gandhi's ideas which were followed by his followers till the time period of 1962 and what happened in 1962 is what we know as the sino india war which india terribly lost so gandhi's ideas on international relations were quite fit for a new born baby country like india not for a mammoth uh, which india today is with 130 billion people and with the fastest growing economy etc etc also india by the uh time we reach 2047 100 years of our independence india plans on becoming a permanent member of the united nations security council now which all india is planning on join is jo join planning to join the league of which all countries united states of america united kingdom russia france china now let me ask every single one and every single of our viewers this question these five countries which one of them is a good boy or a good girl none of them they have fought wars they have protected their own civilizational ethos they have protected their own culture they have done anything and everything to preserve their world view and the same has to be done by india the same india is also trying to do because gandhi's ideas of uh, um, you know if someone slaps you on your right cheek you should be able to take a slap on your left cheek as well that's not how the world today works that's base level romanticism which is very good in literature but again it does not work when it comes to international affairs or it when it comes to geostrategic uh, standpoints that's first now gandhi's views views on economics what gandhi talked about the uh, the economic upliftment of harijans that's absolutely spot on that has to be taken as it is and when it comes to sarvodaya somehow sarvodaya has you know um, again metamorphosized into anto 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 de which is you know to work for the last man or woman standing and that is something which is great but then again a question arises in our mind is sarvodaya truly to the core being followed today sarvodaya talked about universal upliftment but today what we have is upliftment is upliftment of certain sections certain religions certain castes certain communities right so the people again and this is this has all been done by people who claim to be the biggest followers of gandhi irrespective of their political ideology or to which spectrum of political theory they belong that's uh, second uh, and again looking into economics it was a lot of people say that the five year plan model which india has very recently left or which has, india has very left, recently come out of in 2014 before that we had the five year plan model of uh, welfare state economics and planning uh etc etc that model was people say that that model was taken from the erstwhile soviet union but it was actually gandhi's idea and gandhi's theory which were practically implemented by the first prime minister of india pandit jawaharlal nehru and his economic advisors the names of which are pc malan obiston etc etc to name a few now <clears throat> out of 12 five year plans which india undertook in 60 65 years let me ask 
this panel does anyone have any idea how many five year plans were able to achieve their targets zero that again shows that gandhi's idea very good in textbooks but baseline is zero when it comes to active on ground implementation howsoever when we again compare gandhi's thoughts modern day state and the actions which the state has taken uh, there are two directive principles of state policy which have been converted into full time fundamental rights first being gram swaraj which is urban uh, local bodies and rural local bodies in forms of panchayat zila parishad municipalities by the 72nd and 73rd constitutional amendment in the year 1992 and 1993 and then we have right to education which gandhi said universal education especially for the backward communities which is again a fundamental right under article 21 of the indian constitution but if you were to create a pros and cons and a miscellaneous chart excel sheet of gandhi's ideas all we can see is that gandhi's ideas they have very well uh, been connoted in the academic language but they have not been ingrained they have not been drilled down into our political structure into our uh, nation building mechanism into our modern day how we change how we become dynamic all of that that's not how gandhi's thoughts are going to work and in fact if we look at any philosopher any thinker or any thought process the origin if when the original structure or the nuclei of that particular thought starts to change the thought itself gets corrupted which makes the thought more disadvantageous than it was advantageous in its original form and structure and that is what is happening with gandhi's thoughts as well so whatever good gandhi has said more or less that has been practically practically implemented because that is near perfect as i gave you the example of right to education or for that matter even res reservation to the backward communities which he eulogized in his magazine the harijan and uh, upliftment of women gram swaraj uh, panchayati raj etc etc but whatever rest which gandhi said that is mere theory or that is mere hypothesis and the biggest problem with hypothesis especially when it comes to peace is that peace is a very subjective hypothesis and when it comes to modern day india and modern day indian subcontinent and for that matter even modern day world peace is such a subjective hypothesis especially after um, the post covid world that howsoever hard we may try to uh, either retrofit or to cut and uh, contrast gandhi's ideas it is going to be very 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 problematic for the world to take those ideas ingrain it in your dna and to practically implement that so that is going to just create a lag where your world community is running at one pace and one direction and your thought process and your ideation is running in the totally opposite direction which is again going to create conflicts and that is where those when those conflicts are created that is going to create civilizational problems structural problems for the nation which is which will prevent a country like india from growing up from a developing to a developed nation states uh, developed states uh, pedestal so that is where we have to again analyze and constantly look as to where we are headed where we are thinking of heading and where from where we have come so if past present and future is to be analyzed it is very hard to make gandhi's ideas fit in our scheme of affairs thank you so much well that was one side uh, the other side of this debate and this panel discussion and well this is also very important because not every panel discussion can have one sided views and well what makes a panel discussion interesting is the two sided debate that happens in a panel discussion and well on that note i would like to mention how beautifully he stated that what is required is adaptation but an adaptation in the true sense or in the true form what gandhi said because if not then those ideas can get corrupted with time and what his core sense might get lost somewhere well that is one side of the debate now we call upon radhika kataria di to give her views on this heating debate now namaste to all of the ladies and gentlemen and the audience watching me and uh, it's great to be here and the topic for today that we are talking about the relevance of gandhi in today's world so basically from the world of no cell phones to being in the world of 5g world which is now we are in i think the relevance of gandhi ji somewhere or the what like from 
seeing him from our uh, like currencies and reading about him in our textbooks when you know when we see see him and or whatever we have read ahimsa or something and we have also one thing which i would like to talk about i would like to start with gandhi ji was called father of the nation and we are we are reading it from so long in our textbooks or something in general knowledge books but legally there is no father of the nation yes article 18 of the indian constitution talks about abolition of titles where it's mentioned no title not being a military or academic distinction shall be conferred by the state this is uh, something which is mentioned and legally we don't have any father of the nation but yeah he has he did contribute to our freedom struggles and which is basically unforgettable to us and uh, talking about his relevance today and his ideologies which he has basic ideologies as we are talking on the topic of uh, 2nd october gandhi day and it is also known as international day for non violence so i think his major ideologies which we know is truth and non violence satyagraha sarodhya sar uh, swaraj trusteeship swadeshi we talk about such topics and such we have read such ideologies of him so i think a uh, basic thing which i would like to talk about is uh, he talked about non violence in today's world even today if uh, if you have read the news firstly as i told that we have moved such a head that uh, like india is has become the largest economy india has overtaken the uk as for, uh, world's fifth largest economy so in that way i have to say and uh, also today which we saw the news which came today was about uh, indian air force inducts indigenously built light combat helicopter so i think that ideologies won't be working in today's world now and uh, non violence cannot be just a simple answer to it and uh, you know one good thing uh, on maybe something which i l- like about gandhi gandhi ji and his thing was that he talked about uh, stability he talked about using you can say cleanliness basic very good thing in our country or in the world he talked about was cleanliness many people talked about it there are many people who were included in the freedom struggles but a cleanliness which was uh, which he talked about like he let em- emphasis on is and swachhta basically if we say so um, Narendra Modi ji has uh, contributed a lot to it, and he talked about it. He ha- is creating awareness through media, wherein people are much more active than rather they were before. So I think this is one thing which is coming in today's world. And sustainable environment also he talked about. The Gandhi ji held that Earth has enough for human needs, but not for human greeds. So these lines of Mahatma Gandhi ji reflect upon how human behavior destroys nature and how a sustainable way of living is the need of the hour. The you know the world is whirling under a burden of global warming as we have every day you know new statistics like we read new articles or maybe uh, year by year statistics are coming out how global warming is increasing the climate change the resource crunch and all environmental conservation treaties and sustainable development effort. Which are implementing this Gandhi, uh, like Gandhian philosophy, and not, you know, yeah, he laid basic em- emphasis on it. Now talking about the uh, khadi, a uh, very important thing which uh, we were, you know, connected with basically when khadi word used to come. So the another thought which we used to come in the mind was Gandhi ji, Mahatma Gandhi ji. So the you know even which we see the gra- growth and transformation of. Uh, like khadi in not just in our country but worldwide people are liking the way which we used to do it now you know there's a lot more technology to it but yeah in fashion world you can say khadi has become a very khadi products have become important because coming from the villages of india and uh, you are now taking charge in the whole world not just in the uh, like fashion industry but all around everywhere so there are few things which are good but there are few things which are not applicable in today's world as i talked about non violence so i think uh, satyagraha and we were you know taken to the parts of satyagraha ki uh, we we should speak uh, we should speak like we we should be honest or something i think uh, now in today's world as per what we as i to- even told about 5g or something people uh, nowadays are becoming more individualistic more individualistic and they're not dependent on anybody even if kids you see we are adopting western uh western idea of living alone being independent or something so i think that is something which is not working at the moment if we see if we see kids 
getting involved in such things so i think a gandhian philosophy uh, was far back the things which we can take is uh, leninism we can talk about less of the things but now the world has moved a lot more ahead and uh, we are like maybe by 2050 also india can take up like china so these are the things which are happening in present world and there are a lot more things which i am unable to mention here or uh, maybe i am uh, lacking to speak here but yeah we have many more things coming in the world today so relevance of those ideologies were on those times only when india was you can say uh, a kachcha ghada if you can say that kachcha ghada and now india has come a lot more far than that so that is something i wanted to say thank you so much and uh, thank you thank you so much radhika de and i think well what truly came out of this entire discussion is that the, there is a need of evolution because in the in the words are the law of evolution is that the strongest survives and well his ideologies are some that have survived till now but need to save need to pave a way forward in their implementations like everyone says in this panel discussion we are there but what lacks is that some sort of implementation and that is what is the key discussion that came out of this and now before we go on to the round 2 which is the question answer round i would like to summarize the entire debate for our viewers present on this live what beautifully people stated is that what we need is adaptation of the true core values or the core adaptation of the gandhian ideology beautifully we stated that social his ideas on social aspects of pluralism inclusivity secularism and bringing about the two major communities hindus and muslims together talking about caste and harijans sarvodaya which means universal upliftment are the key principles that he talked about his three components of his survival and his core principles were satyagraha swaraj swadeshi these three components drove his life and his ideology of who being who he was he was a great mediator and a leader like sakshi di mentioned he was a great leader of his time he brought about justice he he worked as a just uh, as a mediator to bring about justice whether we talk about in the indigo movement or the ahmedabad movement he was the one who mediated them when we talk about the ethics ethics are something that he beautifully mentioned and he stated as a key principle in gandhian ideology because when we talk about the present day and age his ideologies on ethics are the key principles that drive us because his sense of ethics and morality which is very necessary in the present time when we look at in a world in the era of like radhika di mentioned we live in a 5g world a world filled with social media technology metaverse artificial intelligence and especially metaverse a door that's just close to us in the coming years well what is important is these ideas and the principles of of ethics being incorporated in us as individuals so that when we go and lead a world lead a life in this beautiful world and society as we call we should be prepared for it with the right kind of mindset right kind of values and right kind of ethics that he beautifully mentioned we also talked about the trusteeship and the economical aspect of his ideology in being being incorporated in the present time while we also discussed how his ideologies need an adaptation like kaushal bhaiya mentioned that his ideologies are somewhat archaic in their nature and need an adaptation and core value because the neo colonialism neo gandhian ideology is something that is kind of corrupting the, the core ideology of gandhi and we need the real gandhian ideologies coming forth and raising this ideology and spreading the true essence of this ideology for the right sense of it to be spread across and now when we go to the next round which is the round 2 which is the question answer round because no panel discussion is complete without a question answer round because often we may have ideologies and views that are in some sense very different to us 
and so i would like to request everyone to share in their questions if they have any in the comment section right now we have a question for one of the panelists he beautifully stated that how gandhian ideology has impacted us and has helped india in the pre independence time but how do you think that this ideology is impacting us in today's day and age in today's times and eras in a world which is called the vuca world a world where there is volatility uncertainty uncertainty complexity and ambiguity okay uh, thanks anamita i would like to take a point from here and uh, before that i would like to congratulate uh, kaushal radhika and sakshi for giving putting in some great insights on uh, today's relevance of gandhi and his ideology and uh, like uh, kaushal rightly mentioned in uh, his remarks about uh, adoption and we need gandhian thoughts to be adopted in the right way and uh, with the right implementation today and uh, while doing so he mentioned something about geopolitics and how we are uh, more susceptible to uh, warfare or the new war techniques after post covid era and as you mentioned anamrita uh, in the question right, as of now the that we are entering a buka world where we are more susceptible we are more open to the international threats or international uh, politics or or the geopolitics we can say so again for that i think we should go to the gandhi for uh, an answer and uh, the idea that he pitched in of a secularism or having a society with a pluralistic mindset that is more important and not just an ideal but a need of the hour for us while we go on the global stage where we as a society need to be so inbound as one identity that no one shall break our identity and create some internal security challenges for us so the gandhian thoughts are not just relevant when it comes to secularism but as we go on the buka world and facing them on a uh, challenges like entering into the uh, security council it is more important and more precise time for us that we emphasize on the secularism and binding ourselves into one society secondly like sakshi mentioned on her uh, uh, remark about packaging uh, in today's uh, Uh, international politics or the international policies we have about business and economics uh, to even today government uh, has done something that they have changed the packaging but the core thought of, behind those all policies are same for example i would name two that gandhi ji very profoundly stated that real india resides in its villages and if you want to go from a developing nation to a developed nation we have to develop a villages or the small tier two tier one cities and with this government pushing for 100 more smart cities developing tier two and tier tier three cities into hubs uh, we are trying to uh, address the demographic shift which is happening towards the metropolitan cities and which is unduly generating a stress on their resources like we have recently seen what happened in bangalore or nadu with the floods and uh, with the climate change that is the answer we should uh, explore gandhi mo where he said the real india resides in its villages and we should develop the villages and uh, we should uh, have a holistic approach on development so that thought again uh, is packaged as a net new smart cities but the core thought of it is again which is to mahatma gandhi where he said gram ki or chalo second thing uh, gandhi mentioned about uh, swadeshi in the uh, freedom fight when he boycotted the imported goods and uh, emphasized people to use swadeshi and uh, empowered for and uh, became vocal for the swadeshi products like khadi gramodyog providing uh, uh, livelihoods to people in the villages or providing livelihoods to multiple women through seva gram so these are the same ideologies again which have been packaged as make in india or make for india and we are uh, approaching the world with international business or international economics but the core idea of uh, swadeshi and uh, being local for rural again takes us to the gandhian thought that he had uh, envisioned us for the developed nation and uh, which he had uh, suggested as a tool to become a developed nation because he rightly identified through all his yatras and the encounters he had with the people of india that the potential of real india still lies in the, its villages and uh, if you have to become developed country you have to develop its villages so the so somehow after a, a slow growth or 
the growth of this and journey of 75 years we are now approaching our vuca world we have an open economy for last 30 years almost uh, slow and uh, the world with new uh, like uh, Uh, what happens uh, with the VUCA world? I think uh, as our identity, which I would uh, uh, appropriately say that uh, goes to the thoughts of Gandhi because he was the one who gave those ideas to us as a nation. So as we go on the international stage and face the VUCA world, we should strong, stay strong with our identity, which is the idea of Gandhism. So I think it's not just the relevance, but it is a need of the hour for us. As we face the VUCA world. Absolutely. I think the way you beautifully mentioned that even in the present times when the question was around the VUCA world and when we are entering the VUCA world, the answer, answer still lies in the words of Gandhi. And how you beautifully stated that, you know, Gandhian ideology is something which is something that's everlasting and is something that can be incorporated in every decision, in every decision that we make from politics to personal to even you know uh the you know decisions that we make for the society at large and so going back to the question and then answering that from the words of gandhi is in itself something very important and also i think you also mentioned about how uh developing the tier one tier two cities or for for the most important thing that the economical units which are the rural india and upgrading that and uplifting that is something that will help us in the economic terms and that is what we are seeing even today i think in one of the discussions even kaushal bhaiya mentioned that post covid post covid uh, post pandemic we have seen a lot of migration of people and because there has been a lot of migration a lot of people have gone to their hometowns and that has started to affect the a dynamic of a rural India because rural India is not just people who have who are in need of resources. They are people who have migrated from the urban plan, uh, urban system to the rural system, and thus uplifting rural system in a manner where everyone can be taken together, incorporating the idea of sarvodaya into it. And I think taking everything together will give us a developed program, a developed country, which is something which is presently needed for all of us. Thank you so much, Ashish Bhaiya. And now I would like to move on to the question, which is on regards of Sarvodaya. As we discussed how Sarvodaya is very important in the times and how his ideology, our Gandhian ideology of Sarvodaya was implemented in the pre-independence time. But we are still looking for answers of how this idea of Sarvodaya can be incorporated and implemented in the present day and age, especially when we talk about government system and how these government systems can take the idea of Sarvodaya into their implementation and can implement them in their true sense. Over to you, Sakshi D. As I was saying that... Uh upliftment of ruler masses is much needed and as you have all heard that rich are getting richer and poor are getting uh, poorer the way that i could think of are like uh, urbanizing india's ruler population as you as you said anamitra and uh, supporting uh, startups small businesses and uh, the most important is understanding the gap in rural and urban educational system, the majority of uh, in the majority of people in India lives in rural areas, and uh, the way of progress and development in rural areas will definitely uh, indicate our country's progress in all run in a long run. And uh, you all have must seen that in urban education systems, uh, they are equipped with modern infra infrastructures, innovative and international exposure based uh, learning methods. But on the other hand, uh, in rural areas, they, uh, they lack basic needs of life. So uh, yeah, that would help and uh, the key aspect, the key aspects of uh, development are 
uh, interlinked interlinked and independent like unless they are uh, provided with proper sanitation proper uh, basic needs that a person needs i don't think that they could achieve educational facilities and uh, moreover uh, uh, electricity electricity and uh, infrastructure organic farming credit availability uh, and land and technical reforms too and apart from that we are all uh, well aware of ever climbing cost of living which uh, which uh, through which small firms are unable to withstand the rise in uh, input costs and they are taken over by large companies so all comes back to supporting startups small businesses and uh, you know the educational system in a rural area so yeah that's my take on it thank you thank you anamitra thank you so much sakshini i think the bottom up model that you talked about how from the very basics to increasing it in a manner so that everyone can attain that resource is what sarvoda in the present time really stands for and i think what you talk about sarvoda in the present times giving startups you know having giving those job opportunities rural development i think all these are policies done off by the government and i think these policies are some that will help us get through that bottom up uh, model of economics and you know apply that in the present day and age and help in sarvoda in the present times thank you so much sakshi di and on that note i would like to call one of the panelists who beautifully talked about the civil disobedience movement and the ahimsa and you draw and you draw equivalence between the civil disobedience movement and ahimsa which gandhi stated and you endorse the idea that does not work in today's world so what what are your views on this question and like you know on this topic right uh, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, anamitra for that question and uh... first of all a very big thank you to pinky foundation for this great uh, evening and also to ashish bhai sakshi radhika and to anumitra again for uh, being a great panel now coming to the question on civil disobedience and ahimsa not working more than they not working uh, anumitra the question is and i'll give you know documented evidences and i'll give you examples and anecdotes of how they have been wrongly interpreted misused and then implemented now to give one small example and this particular anecdote or this particular example will include how gandhi's idea was implemented and how gandhi's ideas were ideas were also killed or murdered by people who claim to be gandhi's biggest followers and for that matter some of claim even to be gandhi's descendants now we all talked about how gandhi talked about secularism and sarv dharm sambhav that has been implemented in the indian constitution as the idea of secular now how was secularism introduced secularism the word secularism was introduced introduced in india's preamble which is the introduction to india's constitution via the 42nd amendment now that amendment was so big and so huge and so humongous that it was called the mini constitution of india which was the year in which this amendment was introduced this amendment was introduced in the year 1976 what was happening in india in the year 1976 we had the dark period of emergency going on from the time period of 1975 to 77 now during emergency there was no civil disobedience allowed the entire political opposition was behind bars there was no discussion or debate happening and there was no constitutional morality per se in the government or in governance which could have allowed the discussion to happen and this very idea of secularism by the way was opposed in its terminology by a lot of great thinkers which included dr bhimrao ambedkar in himself if we go and analyze the constitu constituent assembly debates which where the constitution of india was being drafted now look at the hypocrisy of the entire anecdote to implement gandhi's biggest idea you are killing gandhi's greatest weapon to implement gandhi's greatest idea you are killing gandhi's greatest weapon so and 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 every one by the way in this particular incident every single person or every single stakeholder by the way sorry for of of the of the indian government or the indian state was equally involved the executive was of course involved the legislature which took this decision and the thought that the judiciary could have protected gandhi's view 
or the thought that judiciary could have protected the sanctity of the, uh, the, the, the greatest idea as well as the greatest weapon Two also went to the docks when in 1994, the Supreme Court recognized that yes, secularism is a basic principle of the Indian constitution. It cannot be amended. It cannot be changed. So now, <clears throat> again, and this is this is the beginning of a lot of such incidents or anecdotes which have happened where in the name of Ahimsa, in the name of civil disobedience, either the state has been blackmailed, the Indian state has been blackmailed, or the Indian state itself has taken such an uh, anarchic decision that, uh, and and there has been no scope of civil disobedience against the same. So first of all, no state or no civilization runs on a black on blackmail, and when the state itself murders the idea of its own father, I, I feel that the state is not headed in the right direction. So to answer your question, I think. Gandhi's ideas and their implementation, there is a big lag, as I said in my earlier submissions as well. And the if, if we are to singularly point out the blame on someone as to who killed Gandhi's views, it is all of us who have very equally killed Gandhi's views by metamorphosizing those thoughts into something new. And then those new thoughts either backfiring or they not getting implemented in the modern day structure or society, beginning post-independence after our colonial period ended. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this really reminds me of what I just read today. I read a post by Manish Sodia, which said, which talked about how the education policy has truly imp implemented in India, in Delhi, and has impacted Delhi's enrollment rate. And what really was the key takeaway from that was that a policy to be successful should have three components. One is vision. Second is empathy and the third is implementation. And when we talk about how this is incorporated into the Gandhian view or the Gandhian ideology is that we had a great vision. We did have a great empathetic idea and a soft corner towards it, but somehow we lacked in the implementation. But while well, that can be still covered and that gap can be still covered by implementing those core ideas and the core essence of his ideology by bringing that into the our minds and the and the minds and the souls of indians so that when they're doing anything in their life they have that thought of ethics morals and his true ideas of swarad swadeshi and satyagraha in them while making any decision and that will be a goal for us in itself to reach that kind of a position where our citizens have purpose responsibility empathy and vision in them and so now I would like to call upon Radhika Deep and where she stated a where she stated something very positive and very beautiful in her sentence. We're saying living high, uh, simple living, high thinking. And on that note, she beautifully mentioned how the relevance of Gandhism is present in today's day and age. And how when we talk about social issues in the present society, such as mental health, the LGBTQ community plus AI community facing issues and how Gandhism can be incorporated in even those things to find answers for larger perspectives and larger goals. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Anamitra. And uh, thank you to all my panelists for being here and stating your views on it. And you know, uh, and, uh, me being student of journalism and mass communication and uh, stating on such things about social issues, which I read every day or i you know uh hear out from other people in practical world about how you know the world is changing so gandhiji also talked about critical thinking and uh, he also talked about simple living higher thinking but in today's world i see people uh, after covid basically i have to say the world has changed on a different perspective and people have you know uh, let down themselves so there are a lot more mental health issues which we addressed and uh, some are which needs to be addressed. We see so many societal cases. In uh, these cases, uh, you know, Gandhiji also talked about peace. He talked about patience. He talked about such things uh, which are there in the world that people need to learn how to be patient. He People need to address themselves, you know, the uh, how, uh, like one thing I would like to state, which is coming in my mind directly about the mental health is people nowadays state about uh, Satyagraha, which we talked about, uh, like walking on the path of honesty. 
uh, people you know uh, he i want to talk about this thing about mental health like people now state to each other okay i might have depression i might have anxiety or i have something related to it but i think uh, before stating these words uh, we should definitely look up to a psychologist or maybe a psychiatrist and let it be very uh, clinically tested and not stating such things but uh, keeping in mind the critical thinking yes our ideas are bigger than anything in the world you are unique because your ideas are unique so that is something which you need to keep in mind which gandhi ji stated about uh, simple living higher thinking because if you are living simple and you have higher thinking it means you already are living a life of your dreams and life uh, in a life where you do care for not just for yourself but for other people also so these ideas of him do remain in today's world and uh, i think uh, we should uh, like uh, inculcate those in our daily lives and uh, these states forever so that's something i wanted to say thank you thank you so much everyone and i feel this has truly been a very insightful discussion for all of us from stating social issues to talking about trusteeship talking about civil disobedience movement the ahimsa movement and all that has come about that relevance of gandhism is there in today's day and age there may be views that are around us but what is the importance and the key take away from this discussion is that we need evolution and adaptation and adaptation and evolution in the true sense and in true means of what the gandhians truly believed in and what their true essence was and by not really new uh, new uh, gandhism ideas that are corrupted in some sense or the other and so i think those ideas may be archaic in their own sense in their times of pre independence but their relevance still hold in today's time the core principles of him stated in him in his ideologies are some that will last with us forever and well these key principles if stayed with us forever can help us in every life and every life decisions we make and on that note i would like to state him once again wealth without work pleasure without conscience knowledge without character commerce without morality science without humanity religion without sacrifice politics without principles these are the seven sins of gandhi that he states and i think well these principles that he just stated are beyond time and can be some things that can be implemented in our lives forever and should be etched in ourselves while making any decision and making any life thought that we bring about in ourselves and on that note i would like to wish you all a very happy non violence day jai hind jai bharat thank you so much for attending our live and thank you to all the panelists for having this amazing and wonderful discussion thank you everyone jai hind jai bharat thank you thank you anamitra